So in today's talk, um, I will be talking about some of the research I've done with regard to the topic of thinking. And I guess as a cognitive neuroscientist, I'm interested in the way the mind and the brain work. And I guess of all the different things that our minds and brains can do, probably the process of thinking is probably the most important. Because if we consider what life would be without thought, well, it would be really meaningless. There would be little to think about, little to reflect, and we wouldn't be able to well, feel and, and experience all the things that we experience. Now, aside from being sort of central to our private mental lives, this process of thought, uh, the process of thought is also important because the way we think influences our judgments and opinions. Uh, if we think well, we arrive at proper judgments and opinions which are close to the truth. And if we have proper judgments and opinions, that means we can also make better decisions. In other words, thinking uh, uh, well will help us in life because it will help us be successful. Now, with regard to how we can think in order to be successful and to make the right choices, uh, the topic of my presentation here today is this idea that was uh, basically first surfaced in the year 2006 uh, in a book uh, published by Up Dijksterhuis, which was called The Smart Unconscious. And basically the idea of Up Dijksterhuis is um, that we have this kind of unconscious thinking capability that we not only think in the way that we are used to, by, by thinking consciously, so being conscious of what we're thinking about, consciously seeking evidence, uh, seeking ideas, but we, that we can also think at an unconscious level. Basically, we could think while we're doing something else and we could have our unconscious mind solve the problems that we're working on. And another important aspect of the idea of Bob Dijksterhuis with regard to this unconscious thinking is that it was assumed to be a much more powerful thinking process than the conscious mind would be. The idea being that our conscious thinking is limited, we can typically only think about one thing at a time, but that the unconscious mind would be able to, to process multiple streams of information simultaneously and come up with the right answers for us. So that was the idea of Abd Aixas, basically saying that we shouldn't spend our time thinking about the problems we're trying to solve or the judgments we're trying to make, but rather we should be doing something else and let the, uh, the problem solving be done by our unconscious minds. So what I'll be talking about today is whether this idea is actually correct. Oh, I should be pointing at that direction. So what is the actual evidence uh, in support of this, this sort of uh, remarkable idea that when it comes to making judgments and decisions, we should be relying on our unconscious minds instead of trying to think these uh, issues through. So the idea of uh, Abdaixas sort of came to life in 2006, not just with his book, but he actually published three research articles, one of which in science, in which he basically uh, provided the first empirical evidence in support of his idea of an unconscious thinking process. So to give you a flavor of the kinds of experiments that Abd uh, conducted in these studies, here's sort of the general method of all these different studies. So what you see on the, uh, the lower side here is a timeline, and this basically will show you what happens over time in the uh, studies that Abd has conducted. So the general method he uses, I, I should probably use my right hand for this, is first of all, participants are presented with a certain problem, a judgment problem or a problem solving problem, any kind of problem, and I'll give you some examples later. Subsequently, after the problem has been presented to the participants, one group of participants gets some time to think it through, to, to arrive at a judgment or a choice, and the other group of participants is momentarily distracted. They basically get to do another task, like solving a crossword puzzle. And then afterwards, both groups of participants are asked for their response with regard to the problem that was presented to them earlier. So to give you some of examples of the, uh, the studies that Abd has published in 2006, in one of them, in the uh, paper in Science, he used what is called a so-called multi-attribute choice task that basically involves presenting participants with information about many different choice options. And the example here is uh, presenting people with lots of information about different cars and then asking them the question of, well, figure out which of these cars is the best car based on all the information you've been presented with. And then again, uh, people, uh, one group of participants get to think it through, the other group is momentarily distracted, and at the end of the, uh, the trial, the participants may indicate their choice. Now, in another variant of this procedure, uh, he used the so-called creativity task, where basically one of the, uh, the sort of common ways of studying creativity and, and sort of how, people can, uh, how well people can come up with creative solutions to, an, to a problem is this uh, so-called brick task, where you're presented with a brick and you're basically asked to, to indicate all the different things you can come up with that you can do with a brick. Uh, and again, people get either time for thought, momentary uh, distraction, and then they report their ideas. Lastly, the, the third variant of the, uh, the procedure that Abd used in 2006 was a so-called post-choice satisfaction paradigm, 
where he basically asked participants to choose one of six posters. And they, again, were first presented with the six posters, then got time to think through which poster they preferred or they were momentarily distracted. Then they took home the poster, they actually received the poster, and then a couple of weeks later, they were contacted again and asked whether they, they uh, were satisfied with their choice. So what were the main results of these three different kinds of studies? Well, the findings suggested that distraction, as opposed to thinking it through, resulted in better choices, so better uh, capability of picking out the best of the cars, more creative ideas with regard to what you can do with a brick, but also higher post-choice satisfaction. So people were happier with the poster they selected when they didn't think about which poster they would select, but rather uh, made their choice after distraction. And as a conclusion through these three papers, uh, Dijkstra has proposed that we should rely on our unconscious minds when it comes to making difficult choices and judgments. So what I would like to tell you about today is that we're now 10 years further in time, and actually a lot of research has been done on these ideas, especially because they're so important practically speaking. Imagine if it would be true that we would really need to uh, not think about the problems we're trying to solve. Well, that would basically mean that we would be solving crossword puzzles all day long. Uh, we would have no reason to, to spend any time thinking, but rather we could just simply rely on the unconscious mind in solving all our problems. So is this really uh, a proper idea? So let me tell you that uh, a decade of sobering research uh, has suggested that, well, this might not be the truth. So um, a tally uh, recently, uh, yesterday actually, suggests that there have now been 112 published studies that each uh, reported, or, or not published studies, but 112 unique tests of the idea of the unconscious thought advantage. And if we then look at the, uh, the results of these studies, we find that 35 of these studies produced indeed a significant unconscious thought advantage, showing the effect that Abdijkstra has found himself. We find that there are 71 studies that, uh, or tests that didn't show a significant difference, so no difference in performance between the, the group of people who got to think and the group who was distracted. And lastly, we see that there's even six studies suggesting the opposite effects, such that people who got the chance to think about the problem actually ended up making a better judgment or choice. So what is the, the sort of uh, the status of this uh, state of affairs, you might say? Well, according to Abdijkstehuis, uh, he conducted a meta-analysis on all these different studies, and he concluded that the effect is, in fact, real, in spite of the many uh, failures to replicate, but dependent on the details of the experimental method. So it depends on exactly the, the parameters of your method, whether you can replicate this effect or not. And these are so-called moderators of the unconscious thought advantage, according to Dijkstehuis. On the other hand, the critics, uh, the many people who have done studies failing to replicate his uh, earlier results, have suggested that the methods used in this kind of research, where you're um, using a between-subjects design, so half the participants get the thing, the other half is distracted, um, is basically a recipe for spurious results. It's a very complicated task. There will be many reasons why people might differ in their ability to perform this task. So if you use small sample sizes, which is typically the case in this, these kinds of studies, uh, you're likely to find a, a spurious outcome or an unreliable outcome, therefore. So what we did in our study, and that's what I'll be talking about for the rest of this talk, is we basically uh, took these uh, two ideas to test. And so this is the title of our paper. It's called On Making the Right Choice, a Meta-Analysis in Large-Scale Replication Attempt of the Unconscious Thought Advantage. And together with a lot of uh, co-authors and colleagues, uh, we uh, published this work in 2015. So what did we do in this particular study? Well, what we basically did is we uh, did a large-scale study trying to replicate the unconscious thought advantage in a multi-attribute choice task. And we included uh, about 10 times as many participants as the typical studies in this field have used. And moreover, we used a method that was designed in accordance with the uh, recommendations that Abdijkstaars gave with regard to when and how you can replicate his uh, finding of the unconscious thought advantage. So we basically took care to make sure that all the moderating conditions were optimized in our paradigm. And then we were interested in seeing, well, if we use a task that is indeed optimal for replicating this effect, would we find the effect, given that we have a sufficiently large sample that we know that the outcome of our experiment is going to be reliable? So what were the results? So what I'll show you here on the left are the results from the study from Dijkstehuis published in Science in 2006. And we basically used the same kind of paradigm. People were presented with four different cars, lots of information about them. And at the end of the trial, they had to pick the best car, either after distraction or after deliberation. Now, if you look at the results of uh, Dijkstehuis in his science paper, he included 80, 18 participants in the uh, deliberation condition and 20 in the uh, uh, distraction condition. And he found a significant difference in the advantage, in the uh, 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 
a significant benefit of distraction, so an unconscious thought advantage. <laughs> right. Thank you. Uh, so what did we find? Well, we included about 200 participants in each of these conditions, and we really found uh, performance to be nearly equal, even numerically speaking, and definitely statistically speaking, uh, between these two conditions. So what then about all these other studies? Could we also find evidence for this sort of reliability account? Basically, the, the results come out one way or the other if you use small sample sizes, and you only get to the truth if you have a sufficiently large sample. And let me go through this quickly. So what we did is a so-called meta-analysis where we constructed a so-called funnel plot where you're basically showing the effect. So if there's a difference that is positive, it means an unconscious thought advantage. A negative difference means an advantage for conscious thinking. And we're plotting that as a measure of, or as a function of the reliability of these studies, where higher scores on the y-axis indicate more reliability in the study. And what we then see, um, and let me also tell you, uh, as far as time allows, that with this kind of plot, you can nicely map out the regions of statistical significance. So these are findings. If the findings are over here, this means a significant unconscious thought advantage, and this means a significant conscious thought advantage. And the white area here denotes the area in which effects are non-significant. So here's the uh, data point from Updijkstahuis' science paper. And now let's add the other data points from all the studies done since then. And what we then basically see is this distribution all across the board of studies finding effects all well, going from conscious thinking advantages all the way to uh, unconscious thought advantages. And it's a really a mixture distribution. And what you can also tell is as studies get more reliable, they seem to be finding null effects. And indeed, if we add to this graph the data point from our large scale study, we see that it nicely converges with sort of what you expect from the mean of this uh, distribution, which is a null effect. And that is indeed the case. If we do the proper calculations, then it turns out the effect does not exist if you do a proper meta-analysis. So to conclude from this, we found no evidence for the unconscious thought advantage, meaning, and this was a commentary written in Nature uh, in 2015 on the basis of our study, meaning that unconscious thought is not so smart after all. And to bring you to the conclusion of my talk, I guess what we could tell here is that proponents of the unconscious thought theory would be well advised to stop doing all their crossword puzzles and to start thinking about the methods they use in their own research. Okay, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>